in quilting, we're often taught, first we do this, mm -hmm. then we do this, then align this with that, and then do this. But what if you quilted with no rules? My next guest, Diana Fox Rivette, has no quilting checklist, no timeline, and no rules. You might have seen one of her quilts on the cover of the Encyclopedia of Inspiration. They are made up of a fun, random, make it up as you go quilting style, and she's going to tell us all about it. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Diana Fox Rivette. Well, thank you, Diana, for coming to the show. You are coming to us from Squamish, I believe. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> I'm on holiday. But you're regularly from Toronto. Yes. Are you a Toronto girl? Were you born there? I was born and bred in Toronto. I've been there my whole life, other than a couple of years in Halifax at uh, Nova Scotia College of Art. Have you moved around a lot of different neighborhoods or have you always been from that? Downtown. Area? I've always been downtown area. Now I'm in East End, but always downtown area. So when did you make your first quilt? I made my first quilt in 1985, maybe, when I was in art school and it was a hand-painted French dyes, aniline dyes, which we don't use anymore. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know about seam allowances. I'd sewn clothes since I was in grade seven. So it wasn't like I was ignorant of that, but somehow when I was designing this thing, I really didn't do seam allowance, maybe an eighth of an inch or something when I was painting the silk. So it was kind of raggedy, but I mean, it worked out. It was, it was quite beautiful. And then I embroidered it, well, stitched it with gold thread that kept shredding every stitch. It would shred more. And I didn't think to couch it on. That would have been smarter. And then it was all beaded and it was quite, it's, I still have it. It's quite beautiful. And then I made like an all white silks and I, I did a few quilts in, in art school and then after, and then I didn't do any quilting at all. I made a pillow for my daughter when she was born thinking I would make a quilt. That was my dream. I'll make a quilt for my first baby. <laughs> and she got a pillow and that was the end. <laughs> I realized this precision quilting is not for me. But in those days, that was in 2000. I had scissors. I had my old sewing machine. You know, now it's like rotary cutters and proper measuring. Like I was, you know, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So it was very sort of rough and ready but I mean it, it, I still have that too and I mean it worked out really well but it wasn't it was way more work than I imagined ever doing for a baby's quilt and then having two more babies after that forget it that was the end so my first memory of you was you showing up at the Toronto Modern Guild with those teeny tiny hexies yes it's still going <laughs> Yeah, it's been put away for a while, but every now and then I pull it out and I look at it and I'm like, it's pretty big. Should I finish it up or should I just leave it? I haven't figured that out yet. It's mostly about the process. That's where I'll go with this is mostly about spending time with the materials. I never feel like I have to get it done. <laughs> I know, just get it done. <laughs> Which is why this is so ironic because I am so not just get it done. I am just enjoy the process. And when and when you think you're nearly finished, add some applique or add some tiny piecing <laughs> because you just want to keep going. And then hand quilt the thing because you just don't actually want the process to end. Well, I remember that about you right from the very beginning. It was, there's no rules. You might've been starting to make a block, but it quickly turned into something else. And as you say, you just made it, kind of made it up as you went along and added all sorts of different layers and stayed with a project so much longer than I ever would. Yes, I do. And people say that about me. They're like, I could never quilt. I mean, it, you never finish anything. And I'm like, no, people actually do. I choose not to. I mean, I do finish eventually. I, you know, have shown my quilts and they've been in, published and that's not my goal. My goal is completely, I don't know if I bring in mental health, but that's a huge part of it. I make all the time. I'm always, always, always making, I'm drawing, I'm sewing, I'm knitting, I'm, you know, baking. I've always been that person. Even when I was little, you know, I learned to knit and I knit all my 
Barbie clothes and Barbie sleeping bags out of Angora, you know, little fluffy sleeping bags for Barbie and, you know, use my hands. I remember learning how to sew, you know, great big stitches that, you know, and the needle coming out and all that stuff. Doing tiny petty point. I remember when I was like nine, I got a petty point kit because my mom was doing needle point at the time. I would spend hours doing it, hours and hours drawing, coloring. For me, it's always about the process and the time spent with it. And I just feel, and especially with textiles, it is all about time. You can't rush it. I, I don't feel I can rush it. Even what's hanging in, you know, behind, like you've thought about all, you know, how it all works together, right? Like you may get that done and finish it and probably a lot faster than I would because that's your skill level. It takes time. These things are not fast. We don't, we don't work in textiles because it's fast. And if you don't have the stick to itiveness, you're never going to get anything done. So. so did you study textiles at university? I did. I went to uh, OCA and I did, I did screen printing actually, uh, surface design. So I graduated with that. And then I went and studied art history and uh, weaving and dyeing and printing again at uh, Nova Scotia College of Art in Halifax. And I got my bachelor degree there. And then I worked in industry in the wall covering industry for about 20 years as a color designer, mostly. So laying out the wall covering books so that they read in a beautiful color format, coming up with all the new color palettes and, you know, the trends of what's coming. And it was middle market. So how far trend wise you can go and bringing it back. It was fun. It was really fun. When I started in that business, we were all doing hand painting, all the designs, all the colorways were all hand painted, you know, mixed little pots of gouache and color matched and exact matched color colors and to fabric or to, you know, whatever. I, I do call myself a colorist. Like for me, that's what I am. And that's what I'm really interested in. It comes from just honing my color vision through working in industry and being really good at it. Not even having to think about it. That's, I think that's the difference is I just know. So when I'm working, I have all that history, design and color and all the things that go into making something. I don't have to think about it. So I can work really intuitively and know kind of confidently that it'll work out. And if it doesn't, I don't care. I'll just chop it up and rework it. So I can't follow rules. When my kids were little and I did scrapbooking and I loved it and I would make all my own embellishments. And I mean, I'd spend hours, I'd spend a week or two weeks on one layout, you know, on a page. I would go to these workshops and they're going, okay, now we're going to cut the paper 12 times. This, you know, it has to be one and a quarter by two and a half. And I'm like, you've lost me. I can't do that. That's just not me. I've been in a retreat with you where I've seen you slash things. <laughs> not working, slash it up and try something different and just be, oh! and then of course, why not? Why not? We cut up tiny bits of fabric. We cut fabric up <laughs> to sew it back together. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And, and you know what it is, it's fabric. If you cut it and it's wrong, you can sew it back together again. And by the time you've quilted it, no one is ever going to see a seam, you know, if you've made that mistake, not that I ever look at any of this as mistakes. It's like, you just, I'll admit, I started putting like applique circles or squares on the backs or my quilts, usually because I'm cutting a thread and I've snipped the fabric. It happens, right? To everybody. And so at that point, you can't really fix it. So I just, okay, I'll just applique a square on it. I'll applique a circle. And so that's kind of where, you know, that started. And so you can recognize my, I always have circles, always, always, always. And they're almost 90% organic circles. They're not perfect, but it kind of started with, oops, yikes. <laughs> oh, well. That tagline, it started with oops. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's how things evolve for me. And it's, you make a mistake and then you're like, well, I, I'm not going to trash it. I keep going. Right. So you do. And, and I have no fear about that. So is there anything that you consciously think, oh, I brought that from wallpaper? Really just honing my color vision in learning so much about working with color every single day. Design, like balance, that sort of thing. I mean, you can teach these things, of course, but it's just practice. So much of this work, artwork, is practice and confidence and just doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. When we look at 
people and you know how much they produce or how beautiful their work is yeah they've been doing it for the last 30 years it you know we think oh wow they did that on a weekend yeah but they've been doing it for the last 30 years so you know it right and there was also 40 hours of prep before they ever started <laughs> Exactly. And that's another thing. I do not prep. I don't do any preparation at all. I do now, like I do mostly reclaimed fabrics. I'm very careful about what I buy. I always have been because I started quilting because I had a basement full of hand printed fabrics from art school. I can't throw this out. I, I can't move it again. Like I got to do something. So I started quilting. So I, I've, I've always liked to make my own fabrics. So now I'm dyeing my fabrics, but I'm, I'm doing all natural dyes. So I'll dye something and then I'll pull it out later and I'll re-dye it and I'll change it and whatever. But then when it comes to sitting down to actually make something like right now, I just, I just cut up little tiny bits of fabric and I just hand stitch them all together. And then it just sort of grows from there. But I don't consciously have a plan for it. Did you realize the mental health benefits of quilting before you started? I had major mental health issues when my children were young, uh, major depression. And I started doing, they were kits from Australia. I can't remember the name, but they were tiny little needlepoint kits. Again, very small. I could put them in my purse. I could take them to the park. I could take them to the uh, coffee shop. And like, that was my mental health because I had three kids under two. And if I got a moment, I would just stitch. And I started knitting washcloths. That was sort of where my brain could cope. I couldn't write. I couldn't draw. I, I couldn't function at all, but I could stitch. Again, mindless. Those were kits where the canvas was painted and you had the color. But I, even then I switched off the colors and then I added borders to them that I designed and stuff. But yeah, it was just a matter of sitting there and stitching and knowing, like, I've always known that it's, it's a mental health thing. It's huge, 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 huge. Like now I'm healthy, but I have to work all the time. That's what keeps me happy. Now you've just also gone through a period of grief. You've lost a really important person in your life. Did you turn to quilting to help you there or did you have to pivot a bit? Of it? Well, you know, it's funny because we shared a studio. Uh, Miriam was very precise in her work. She was a weaver, incredible. Everything she touched was golden. I have notebooks, you know, she would like do all the math and the planning and the color and the, the like she was so opposite me because she was so organized and her studio half was tidy and you know, organized. And then you'd walk on and like you came in the door to my side and it was like whoosh, a big explosion of like color and like piles of fabric and thread and yarn and like paint and whatever just like a mess and we really played off each other really well you know not that I and our work it was so completely different there was no never any competition and this person I went to art school with so I've known her forever working every day with someone like that like we had good temperaments to to share I wouldn't say I turned to quilting in fact I probably didn't do, I haven't done a whole lot. I've had a real uh, year of just trying to figure out what's next and whether being an artist is like, if I have anything important to say or do, I, I don't know. I like, honestly, I have no idea where my next steps are going. Uh, she, she was my like guiding light and I don't know. It's been a really tough year trying to figure out where to go. And I'm still on that journey. I like holidays because I don't have to think about it. And I go home and I'm like, oh, geez, now I'm, I have to figure out where I'm going. So I've, I find it really, it's still really, really raw. Have you found in this past year that you're attracted to different colors because of your grief? Uh, not specifically, because as I said, I'm I, like behind me is all like, you know, commercial fabric. Uh, so, and it's a very bright, happy palette. I'm using natural dyes mostly now. So they are much more muted and I'm loving that feeling. I've always been drawn to vintage and worn out things. So I'm embracing that more. Yeah. So that like affects my palette, but then I don't have any pieces to show, but like, I've just been doing a lot of very small hand pieced pieces. So that's the other direction I've taken is I have a beautiful sewing machine and I use it to make garments, but I don't really use it at all in my quilting anymore 
most of my pieces are now hand stitched, like hand pieced and then hand quilted. And that partly because then I can just travel with it, take it with me. And because I work small, often like start small, it's, I always have it in my bag. I always have work in my bag. Have you done a lot of traveling in the past couple of years? Your children are on opposite sides of the world. I know. Uh, I've been to Squamish quite a lot, <laughs> which is beautiful. I've seen now the summer, I've seen the winter, and I saw the fall. Uh, I went skiing out in Whistler, broke my arm. That was quite uh, traumatic. <laughs> Hiked up to the peak chair yesterday to revisit where I fell and broke my arm. <laughs> so do you use any tools at all now when you're quilting or is it just needle and thread? Scissors and needles and thread. That's it. So my 10 favorite tool <laughs> video from last week is totally <laughs> not applicable. applicable. You know, when I watch those, I watch a lot of your videos, but yeah, no, I, my work is just really different. And I'm doing a lot of mending and I'm teaching mending workshops and darning and, you know, that sort of thing. So again, it's all handwork. Are you doing that at Fabric Spark? I am. I'm teaching at Fabric Spark and I'm also teaching uh, through East End Arts um, Organization, a layered embroidery workshop that I'm doing. You know, coming to the Toronto Modern Guild and watching other quilters that you're just on a different path than most other quilters? Uh, yes, I am on a different path. I feel like I don't quite fit into the modern guild and I don't quite fit into the uh, Sakwa, the, you know, studio artist quilt guild. I, I feel I'm kind of bridged between the two of them. I'm kind of an artist, kind of a craftsperson, kind of a trying to figure out where I fit. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Yeah. I look at all this and make, there's some incredible work being done. It blows me away. And I think, uh, you know, it's like way better than my work, you know, and then people, I had my quilts hanging at Fabric Spark in July and people were like, came specifically to see my quilts. And they're like, oh my God, it is so amazing. And I'm like, oh, thanks. I needed that because I was really feeling down about it. Like we are exposed now to so much incredible work all over the world and, and so much, so many prolific people, whether, I don't know how they find the time, but just so much information. I, it can get really depressing. And you think, what the hell am I doing? Like, why, why am I doing this? Why there am I? There are some just, I agree with you. There's just so much and people are discovering or rediscovering and reinventing technique. Yeah, totally. We have so many people coming in from so many other disciplines, uh, yeah. whether they be engineers or artists or wallpaper designers like yourself, and they're bringing all that knowledge in. I think it was there before. It was just not recognized before, you know, when a woman was stranded on the prairie <laughs> with no neighbors, but she was a natural engineer. What did she do? She possibly turned to quilting. But I see every day something I'm going, how did they think of that? Like, yeah. where did that come from? Isn't that amazing? This is new. This is different. Well, and I think now we are respecting creativity so much more, you know, whether that was, you know, through COVID and people had an opportunity to try different things or had more time to work on things, but just creativity in general and just do it kind of attitude as opposed to, oh, well, I'm not good at that, you know, or I can't do that. They're like, oh, well, let's try. And then they find how valuable it is, whether it's just mental health or how amazingly creative they are. Like we are all creative beings. We just have to find the way to be that, whether it's through food or writing or music or art or quilting or, you know, we all have that in us. And when people say, oh, I, I'm not creative. It's like, you are. Even engineers, like, you know, you designed a bridge. Like, <laughs> that's not my skill. I think that we've realized how valuable creativity is and how horrible the world would be without it. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Well, I think people are also discovering the importance of color in their lives. You mm -hmm. know, we've all been told these are your colors or mm -hmm. this is the color for this or this is the color for that. And then realizing, you know, I don't look good in black. <laughs> I don't. But yeah, I, that's not my natural affinity. I don't really gravitate towards that. We gravitate towards what works for us, right? Yeah, I'm I looking at your quilt it. behind you and the quilt behind me, and they're essentially the same colors. They totally are. Yeah. They're just laid out quite differently. Yeah. Yeah. So this started out with, again, 
like tiny little applique dots. They're all about the size of a penny, I guess. Like applique onto tiny little solid fabrics and then just like sort of sewn all together in a jumble. And Do you bury your stitches? They were all invisible, uh, you know, the applique stitch, but it's, and I use silk thread so that it just disappeared. I didn't think to do like applique. I think that would have been too busy. I love that quilt. Thanks. Yeah, I did too, actually. It hangs in our hallway and I brought it away with me and my partner was like, oh, you're taking that away. (laughs) Well, this one has been on display at a gallery as well, has it not? The last time they had the quilts at the Crete show, I had uh, several quilts there. On the, it's on the cover of the uppercase quilting book, actually. Now, do you use a variety of different uh, materials as well, or do you just stick to cotton? I'm using a lot more linen, and I have old silk that I printed or painted years and years ago that I'm using. So I'm mixing my fabrics more. Uh, as I said, I'm using a lot of reclaimed fabrics, so I'm, uh, I use what I have. I love linen. I love old linen because it's just so soft and it quilts so beautifully it show, and it dyes beautifully. I'm coming late to linen. I mean, there's Essex linen, but just the other types of linen and realizing linen has been around an awful long time. Forever. It's a little gentler on the environment than cotton. The process of linen is pretty incredible how we get this fiber. I try and buy uh, linen clothes and I pick them apart or I dye them and then I pick them apart so you can see the difference of how the dye reacts to the, you know, within the felt seams and the the flat cloth. I love how you can see the wear of things. I pick things apart very carefully, stitch by stitch. I don't tend to cut, 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 even though I know it's maybe a waste of time. That's all part of the process of, I literally... (laughs) pick each stitch out. I just love it. I recently made a quilt with the um, ends of 1970s bed sheets. And I bought just like the tops and tails of them. I picked out all the threads and then opened them up. And you could see, because these things had been used so much, like the fade mark at the top of the sheet where it rolls over, folds over. And I just, I love that. I just love that. It's like, that's part of the usage of it, the, the wear and tear of it. And, and to me, that's like the highlight of that quilt. The other highlight is where it's misprinted on one of the pieces. I just think that's fantastic because it's like totally out of register. And as a printer, I'm like, good for you. <laughs> now you've talked about printing a couple of times. Have you considered printing on top of your quilt? I have considered that. Sometimes I print the fabric before you know, just stamping or using even like iron mordant and stamping on fabric and that sort of thing. I am kind of leaning towards doing more surface design on my fabrics. And I have thought about either printing over them, like once they're quilted, so you get like um, another layer. I just haven't gone forward on that. I've been setting up a studio at home now, and that's been... uh, quite a job. So I'm still not settled where I'm at. Isn't it funny how difficult it is to move into a space and how long it takes to get everything where it works for you? Well, and I'm working between two rooms, a basement room and a second floor room. And and I tend to work on the dining room table because I want to work with people. I don't like working all by myself. I mean, sometimes I do, but I like the you know, the kids around and stuff. I mean, if I'm working all the time and I'm stuck in a room, that's kind of boring. I have like a sewing room upstairs and a painting studio downstairs. And so I took up painting, acrylic painting, uh, like two years ago. I thought, oh, this has got to be faster than quilting. Like, this is <laughs> quilting is ridiculous. <laughs> like I can do the same thing, play with color and shape and design and value and all this stuff. And I can paint and oh, it's going to be fast. I'm going to sell these things. I'm going to make a little money. That would be nice. (laughs) And let me tell you, painting is not faster. (laughs) I do the same thing. I'm like, I paint and I layer and I paint and I pull it back and I paint and I, you know, and it's, it takes hours and hours and hours. It's fun. Whenever I'm thinking, whenever I'm drawing, I always go back to textiles. Whenever I'm dreaming, 
and I'm like, I want to make X, it's always fabric. I have all these other supplies that I love. I always gravitate towards textiles because there's the, the tactile quality and the hand quality and the working and that it gets better as you work it. And there's something about the usefulness of quilts. Even if they're not big enough for a bed, I use them on my bed. I just layer them up <laughs> and <laughs> I just love it. And then I do the fronts and the backs and both are patterned. I flip them over depending on how I feel. Have you considered collecting textiles? I have. If I had more money, <laughs> if I had a budget, yeah. I have a couple of old quilts uh, that I've purchased and I am very drawn to old things. I have a collection of old thread that I actually use. And it started from my grandmother when she died and I got her sewing basket. Gradually, I've added to that. And sometimes sometimes it's difficult to use because you can only use like maybe a 10 inch piece because I've, I've got these silk threads that are so beautiful, but they, they do break very, they're pretty uh, fragile. I used to buy old linens at church rummage sales, bazaars and stuff, big bin full of this stuff. So I dye it and use it. And I love old, old stuff. When you're quilting, have you experimented with stitches? Are you just doing a running stitch? These days I'm just doing a running stitch. I've just started to experiment more in, well, through visible mending and experimenting on different stitches. I've done embroidery work in the past and a variety of stitches and other work, uh, but I haven't done it in quilting. I'll make a quilt top and I'm like, oh, I pretty like that. And then I'll do the back and I like it way better because it's, you know, like these big patches of beautiful color that very haphazardly laid out. I didn't really think about it. And that appeals to me more these days. And then just very organic stitching tends to be, you know, swirls and round and circles. And I just take a butter knife and I sort of woo like this and quilt that. And I love that. So I'm kind of gearing towards more simple. There's going to be a lot of people who think the same way. And I think there's going to be a lot of people who appreciate all your advice to just let it go mm -hmm. just experiment and let it flow and time is not of the essence it's a journey it's fun if you take the left fork instead of the right that's perfectly okay <laughs> well exactly and it, it's meant to be fun we do these things because they feel good so why do we stress ourselves out so much I mean I just I don't need that extra stress I have other stuff. So if it never gets finished, you've learned so much just by doing that. Not everything needs to be finished. I think the stress comes from two things. One, there's the perfectionist stress. Mm -hmm. uh, people are not wanting to be a beginner. The second thing is that the quilting world is run by fabric and it becomes all about the fabric and we collect this fabric and how in the heck do we consume it? So it becomes a rush to make a quilt. Otherwise that fabric that was so fantastic ends up in your stash. And by the time you get around to it, it's dated and you're like, uh, why did I buy that? I have a really hard time with that. I know what production is having been in wall covering, like the fabric industry and the fashion industry is killing us in this world. I don't know how many collections each company is doing each year, but they must be putting out like 30 collections a year. Like who needs this much fabric? It's all chemically dyed. It's killing the water source. It's killing like the cotton. Like it just mm, makes me crazy. Absolutely makes me crazy. Like I've always been, buy one thing, love it, wear it to death. Don't buy a bunch of clothes. Now art supplies are a different thing. I go to an art store and I can't leave without something. <laughs> Usually neon pink paint for instance or a hot pink magic marker or pink ink or yeah it's usually pink if people want to find you how do they get a hold of you i have a website uh it's called playing with color and then i'm pink inked on instagram and facebook and you're teaching at fabric spark in the fall I am. I'm teaching at Fabric Spark. And do you have a lecture if people are interested in having you for a lecture? I have done a trunk show with the Ancaster Quilt Guild uh, before COVID, and it was really great. I would totally do that again. I'm kind of toying with the idea of teaching something in the way of how to not think when you're quilting, like that more intuitive kind of working. So we'll see.
Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And I hope we'll meet in person soon for a cup of coffee. We will for sure. Thank you. This was awesome. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Diana Fox Rivette. She always inspires me to relax, take a few chances, and take a left turn if I want to. Talking with her also reminded me that some of us are quietly hanging on by our fingernails. Please ask for help, and maybe quilting can be part of your journey to heal. I will have Diana's contact information in the video description notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Shelley Scott Tobish, and we will be talking about completely the opposite, precision sewing. And you don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting people on this show. Let one inspire you. And check out my latest videos on some amazing ways to use up your scraps. Take care, and I'll see you next time.